Hi folks, thanks for watching my monologue. As America starts to reopen, just remember that guns, etc., never closed. They still have over 10,200 square feet of ammo, firearms, and accessories, including safes, and they remain open for business. Stop by their huge store in Mesa or just click on gunsetc.com. And if you like my monologues, please subscribe to 960 The Patriots YouTube channel. Thanks. Welcome back and happy June 9th, 2020. You've heard me before relate the importance of a then small address that has since become a really big one that Abraham Lincoln delivered when he was only 28 years old. The year was 1838. It's known as his Lyceum Address. It was in a time of great anarchy gripping the United States, perhaps not too dissimilar from today. It was titled The Perpetuation of Our Political Institutions. I think we could all use a little Lincoln right now, and I think, too, we could all use a little booster shot on why the perpetuation of our political institutions matter. He opened by sta stating, quote, In the great journal of things happening under the sun, we, the American people, find our account running in the peaceful possession of the fairest portion of the earth as regard extent of territory, fertility of soil, salubrity of climate, we find ourselves under the government of a system, political institutions, conducing more essentially to the ends of civil and religious liberty than any of which the history of former times tell us. We, when mourning the stage of existence, found ourselves the legal inheritors of these fundamental blessings, mounting, sorry, mounting the stages of existence, found ourselves the legal inheritors of these fundamental blessings. We toiled not in the acquirement or establishment of them. They are a legacy bequeathed by a once hardy, brave and patriotic, but now lamented and departed race of ancestors. Theirs was the task, and nobly they performed it, to possess themselves and through themselves us of this goodly land, and to uprear upon its hills and its valleys a political edifice of liberty and equal rights. Tis ours only to transmit these, the former, unprofaned by the foot of the innovator, the latter undecayed by the lapse of time and untorn by usurpation, to the latest generation that fate shall permit the world to know. The task of gratitude to our fathers, justice to ourselves, duty to posterity, and love of our species in general all imperatively require us faithfully to perform. How then shall we perform it? At what point shall we expect the approach of danger? By what means shall we fortify against it? Shall we expect some transatlantic military giant to step the ocean and crush us, crush us at a blow? Never. All the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa combined, with all the treasure of Earth, our own accepted, in their military chest, with a Bonaparte for a commander, could not by force take a drink from the Ohio or make a track on the Blue Ridge in a trial of a thousand years. At what point, then, is the approach of danger to be expected? I answer, if it ever reach us, it must spring up amongst us. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die by suicide. I hope I am over wary, but if I am not, there is even now something of ill omen amongst us. I mean the increasing disregard for law which pervades the country, the growing disposition to substitute the wild and furious passions in lure of the sober judgment of courts, and the worse than savage mobs for the executive ministers of justice. The disposition is awfully fearful in any community, and that it now exists in ours through grating to our feelings to admit it would be a violation of truth and an insult to our intelligence to deny it. Accounts of outrages committed by mobs form the very, excuse me, form the everyday news of our time. They have pervaded the country from New England to Louisiana. They are neither peculiar to the eternal snows of the former nor the burning suns of the latter. Whatever then their cause may be, it is common to the whole country. Is this not true today? Lincoln then recounted many acts of vigilantism against judges, newspaper writers, blacks, whites, all kinds of people. He then said, quote, such are the effects of mob law and such is the scenes becoming more and more frequent in this land so lately famed for love of law and order and the stories of which have been now grown too familiar to attract anything more than an idle remark. 
But you are perhaps ready to ask, what has this to do with the perpetuation of our political institutions? I answer, it has much to do with them. Its direct consequences are, comparatively speaking, but a small evil, and much of its danger consists in the proneness of our minds to regard its direct as its only consequences. He then ran a few more examples and then said this, quote, when men take it in their heads today to hang gamblers or burn murderers, they should recollect that in the confusion usually attending such transactions, they will be as likely to hang or burn someone, one who is neither a gambler nor a murderer, as one who is, and that acting upon the example they set, the mob of tomorrow may and probably will hang or burn some of them by very mistake. And not only so, the innocent, those who have ever set their faces against violation of law in every shape, alike with the guilty, fall victim to the ravages of mob law. And thus it goes on, step by step, till all the walls erected for the defense of the persons and property of individuals are trodden down and disregarded. But all this, even, is not the full extent of the evil. By such examples, by such instances of the perpetrators of such acts going unpunished, the lawless in spirit are encouraged to become lawless in practice, and having been used to no restraint but dread of punishment, they thus become absolutely unrestrained. Having ever regarded government as their deadliest bane, they make a jubilee of the suspension of its operations and pray for nothing so much as its total annihilation. While on the other hand, good men, men who love tranquility, who desire to abide by the laws and enjoy their benefits, who would gladly spill their blood in the defense of their country, seeing their property destroyed, their families insulted, and their lives endangered, their persons injured, and seeing nothing in prospect that forebodes a change for the better, they become tired of and disgusted with a government that offers them no protection and are not much averse to a change in which they imagine they have nothing to lose. Thus then, by the operation of this mobocratic spirit, which all must admit is now abroad in the land, the strongest bulwark of any government, and particularly of those like constituted like ours, may effectually be broken down and destroyed. I mean the attachment of the people. Whenever this effect shall be produced among us, whenever the vicious portion of population shall be permitted to gather in bands of hundreds and thousands and burn churches and ravage and rob provisions and stores, throwing printing presses into rivers, shooting editors, and hanging and burning obnoxious persons at pleasure and with impunity? They depend on it. This government cannot last that way. By such things, the feelings of the best citizens will become more or less alienated from the government and from their fellow man, and thus it will be left without friends or with too few and too weak to make their friendships at all effectual. At such a time and under such circumstances, men of sufficient talent and ambition will not be wanting to seize the opportunity, strike the blow, and overturn that fair fabric, which for the last half century has been the fondest hope of lovers of freedom throughout the world. I know the American people are much attached to their government. I know they would suffer much for its sake. I know they would endure evils long and patiently before they would ever think of exchanging it for another form of government. Yet notwithstanding all this, if the laws be continually despised and disregarded, if their rights to be secure in their persons and property are held by no better tenure than the caprice of a mob, the alienation of their affections from the government is the natural consequence. And to that, sooner or later, it must come. Where, then, is one point at which the danger may be expected? The question occurs, how do we fortify against it? And the answer is simple. Let every American every lover of liberty, every well-wisher to his posterity, swear by the blood of the revolution, never to violate the least particular the laws of the country, and never to tolerate their violation by others. As the patriots of 76 did to support the Declaration of Independence, so did the support of the Constitution and laws. Let every American pledge his life, his property, and his sacred honor. Let every man remember that to violate the law is to trample on the blood of his father, and to tear the character of his own and his children's liberty. Let reverence for the laws be breathed by every American mother to the lisping babe that prattles on her lap. Let it be taught in schools, in seminaries, and in colleges. Let it be written in primers, spelling books, and in almanacs. Let it be preached from the pulpit, proclaimed in legislative halls, and enforced in courts of justice. 
and in short, let it become the political religion of the nation. And let the old and young and the rich and poor and the grave and the gay of all sexes and tongues and colors and conditions sacrifice unceasingly upon its altars. Pretty beautiful, isn't it? Lincoln then spoke of the passing of generations from the founding and how much harder it was to instill patriotism with each passing year as each passing year left the country with less and less memory of its founding. The vanishing frame of reference, we call it. So he concluded, quote, Passion has helped us but can do so no more. It will in future be our enemy. Reason, cold, calculating, unimpassioned reason, must furnish all the materials for our future support and defense. Let those materials be molded into general intelligence, sound morality, and in particular, a reverence for the Constitution and laws, and let it be said that we improved to the last, that we remained free to the last. Let the proud fabric of freedom rest as the rock of its basis, and as truly as has been said of the only greater institution, let not the gates of hell prevail against it. Indeed, I do think America is a sacred place, a sacred country built by sacred honor. Can we repair to our founding and our noblest and somehow get through this time, the hardest of times so many of us have borne witness to lately? If we do not, the stakes are truly the forces of decency over indecency and the dystopia so many people love to think we are in truly will become our outcome and our future. It does not have to be.